Hello, I'm James Yardley, and today I'm joined by Alistair Wittert, the Fund Manager of Comgest Growth Europe X UK. Alistair, thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Alistair, there's obviously been quite a lot of negative sentiment towards Europe recently, a lot of talk about um, gas prices, inflation, and a potential recession, but earnings have held up relatively well. So can you help get us uh, give us a feel for sort of the the on the ground picture at the moment what's the what's the reality of the situation so the reality actually surprisingly for now is that it's business as usual for most companies um so for the most part especially in the portfolio uh, the companies that are continuing to deliver very good numbers and first half results for the portfolio um have seen earnings grow 20% uh, this year over last year um so fundamentals remain very strong of course, share prices tend to um, tend to move before the fundamentals, and share prices, as you mentioned, so far this year are down quite substantially. And that's, of course, in anticipation of um, of what is likely to be a recession at the tail end of this year or the beginning of next year, uh, rising and um, very high levels of inflation, and of course, all of that compounded by tightening credit uh, conditions. So I think it is quite reasonable, and most companies on the ground are expecting. Um, much tougher conditions in the second half of the year and into next year, and they are preparing their businesses for that environment. And are there any countries or sectors which you particularly like or dislike at the moment? I think, especially as we enter what is likely to be um, a recession, um, I think there are certain characteristics that are going to become very important. Um, the first is going to be uh, the defensiveness of the company's revenue streams. And there are, of course, uh, uh, revenue streams out there which are far more defensive than others. Um, think of healthcare, for example. Healthcare spending uh, in US um, records has never fallen. And that includes, of course, multiple financial crises, including, of course, a health crisis uh, in the form of COVID. Um, so we think that is a space that will continue to be defensive. Um, but of course, there are other defensive spaces. Staples companies tend to be more defensive um, in recessionary environments. But then there are some sectors that might surprise you as being defensive. Uh, luxury goods. Um, is actually a, a quite defensive sector, particularly uh, the most desirable brands, brands like Hermes, who even in the financial crisis of 2008-9 was able to generate revenue growth. So I think defensive revenue streams is going to be very important. Um, the second is going to be within those um, markets which are slightly less defensive, um, people tend to concentrate their purchases um, and they concentrate them towards the stronger brands. Um, so we are already seeing that so far this year. Uh, look at the difference in, for example, the performance between L'Oreal and Unilever, both of which have had to push through big price increases. But Unilever is seeing their volumes decline by a couple of percent. L'Oreal is generating close to 7% growth in their volumes. So people tend to concentrate their purchases. And of course, it's much easier when you're selling a dream in the case of L'Oreal than when you're selling soap in the case of, of Unilever. So I think we're going to see uh, the strong get stronger in that sense. And I think a third area which will be important are companies who have idiosyncratic growth. Um, remember, we're buying businesses, we're not buying a market. And of course, there are businesses that have growth drivers that are quite irrelevant to the broader economy. Um, take a company like Straumann. It's a dental implants leader. There is no doubt that there is a certain consumer sensitivity to the purchase of a dental implant, but they have a very important driver of growth in the form of their clear line of business, which they're currently rolling out across their dental network. So even if there is a, a certain weakness in consumer spending, that growth driver is in many ways idiosyncratic. It is somewhat irrelevant to the macro environment and will drive growth for the company. So I'd say those are three areas which are going to be quite important in the months to come. And how dependent on China are European companies uh, at the moment? I think you recently uh, mentioned Adidas's sales have been hit due to their Chinese exposure. Um, but as you say, luxury brands seem to be holding up better. So um, surprisingly, maybe China isn't actually an enormous part of the European market, nor indeed of the portfolio that we're talking about today. So it constitutes around 6 six seven percent of sales. Um, for the MSCI Europe and for the portfolio. Um, and to give you an idea, it's smaller than, for example, the UK or Germany as an end market. So it's not irrelevant, but I wouldn't want to overstate the importance of China. Now, where China has been um, a challenge for some Western companies um, or for companies in general is in two forms. First, regulatory pressure, uh, particularly in the internet and tech space. Uh, and secondly, um, 
through um, increasing nationalistic spending patterns. So moving away from international brands towards local brands. And this is, of course, in, in, in the wake of the Xinjiang um, uh, controversy where a number of Western brands um, said they were going to stop sourcing their cotton from that region, which created a, 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 a boycott on the part of Chinese consumers of those brands. And Adidas um, was in the middle of that, of, that, of that maelstrom and suffered from that. Um, that being said, the majority of our exposure to China actually comes from the luxury space, as you mentioned. And these luxury brands um, continue to be highly desirable in China. And it also comes from the healthcare space, where these are businesses selling um, uh, proprietary and um, patent protected either drugs um, or, or medical equipment. Um, and there, that continues to be an attractive market. So I'd say for the most part in the portfolio context, China actually China actually remains an, an attractive and exciting growth opportunity with the odd pocket of difficulty in the case of Adidas, as you mentioned. And what changes have you been making in the portfolio recently? So we are uh, long-term investors. Um, our investment time horizon is um, five years and more, and we've held companies for 20, 30 years um, in our pan-European uh, strategy. And we tend to take advantage of these market sell-offs to buy into or to increase our exposure to some of the best long-term uh, companies in the portfolio. And so we've been doing that since the start of the year. We've been adding to um, some fast-growing companies like Adian in the payment space, um, a very high quality and fast-growing Dutch payments processor. Uh, we've also been adding um, to a company called Sartorius Stedham, which is a provider of um, medical uh, devices or medical equipment to the pharmaceutical in industry. Um, that has also been a fast growing company and one which we had um, unfortunately not been able to own as much as we would have liked because the valuation was too high and the sell-off since the start of the year has created a buying opportunity there. So where we, where we see opportunities in this sell-off, we've been adding to those, to those names. And why should investors be considering European equities today? Uh, why not invest elsewhere in the US or UK or Asia? I wouldn't necessarily um, make an argument for owning Europe in general. Um, I'm sure there are other people much better placed to, to comment on whether that's, um, that's a good region to have exposure to. I would argue get exposure to some brilliant European companies. And Europe does hold some of the best companies in the world. We have excellent expertise in brands. We have some of the strongest, in particular in the premium space, brands like Hermes, like Louis Vuitton, uh, like L'Oreal, um, with an amazing heritage in those brands and a, a knowledge of how to manage those brands. So I would say that's one area where we have uh, some great businesses in Europe. We also have some of the best innovation in Europe, especially in the medical space. Uh, we have great pharmaceutical companies. We have the leaders in the oncology space, in the case of Roche, in the diabetes space, in the case of Novo Nordisk, it's no, it's no coincidence, I would say, that the first two vaccines to be discovered were European companies. So we have a great expertise in Europe there. And then the third space is software. Um, Europe is, of course, where SAP was born, uh, one of the first and largest software companies in the world. And we have a... Um, a culture, we have a, um, a great number of great software companies in Europe, whether that be um, in the um, 3D design space in the form of Dassault System, uh, in the asset management space, uh, in the form of Simcorp. Um, so I think that's another space where we have some great businesses. So I would say uh, there are some great businesses in Europe, and I would look to get exposure to those rather than saying get exposure to Europe as an economy. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, thank you very much, Alistair. That's been uh, really interesting. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much. Thank you. And if you'd like to learn more about the Comgest Growth Europe X UK Fund, please visit chelseafs.co.uk.